Welcome to most likely the final instalment of Why the Managerialist State Will Fail, continuing on from our notes. Whether authentic or merely projected as a means to secure power, as stated before, managers rely on their ability to coerce humans into compliant patterns of behaviour in order to produce their promised efficiency. However, in relation to that latter point, this is not always the case. As we have stated previously, in the quote documented above, we can see that the managerialist mindset is one that is firmly rooted in hubris, a wildly erroneous self-image, and an uncontrolled ego. The trucker protests in Canada and the manner in which they were handled was beyond appalling and showcased the deeply tyrannical nature of the system, yes, but also conveyed the total incompetence inherent in the managerialist class. It relayed to the populace who already distrusted the managerialist class and their overarching agenda for power and the reformation of society along the lines of mandated efficiency that the old disguise of liberalism and inalienable rights were gone entirely and could be denied if the managerialist regime declared an quote quote emergency. The term emergency would be defined by themselves, at their own discretion of course. Ultimately this highlighted the rather sobering truth, that the managerialist regime does not believe that the majority of human beings are worth very much, that we constitute this newly emerging useless class under the shadow of the advent of the age of automation. And this is also indicated by the stagnancy of wages and the diminishing living standards caused by central bank induced poverty. For the promise of efficiency, spontaneity and unpredictable responses must be suppressed or eliminated as to maximise power and produce the highest yield possible with the system's disposable resources. This is another reason for AI by the way, which is distinct from AGI or advanced, eh, pardon me, or artificial general intelligence. Artificial general in intelligence can make what one could call structural general generalizations. That is, using one's knowledge base to reformulate and to create something that could be perceived as a novel or emergent thought. Right now, AI, all it can do is essentially plagiarize and paraphrase. That is it. That is all AI can do. Most of the chatbots, that is all they can do. In this sense, this is why the likes of Bill Gates wants to uh, bring uh, AI algorithms like Strawberry into uh, the classroom. Um, we, we see recently that was, that was a new story that uh, was doing the rounds within the mainstream media. In relation to the above quote from Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue, he goes on to cite a myriad of sources detailing increased predictability beyond a certain threshold, leads an organisation to ruin, eliminating its ability to pursue and discover novel solutions outside of the inflexible and strict bureaucratic system. In other words, brittleness begins to set into the managerialist paradigm due to the fundamental miscalculation inherent within their philosophy, and that is the uncompromising dream of the managerialist being solely locked within the possibility of both autopoiesis, self-regulation, self-organisation of, uh, of a system, and hence a system that can defy entropy or decay, a system that can artificially exist outside the constraints of existence or existence without the vital need for change. This assures predictability, the primary boon of power within the managerialist thinking, and hence the maintaining of power into perpetuity, with the species potential able to come to full fruition, as defined by the managerialist. However, this is a Faustian pipe dream, and this axiom or conviction leads the managerialist regime down the road of perdition due to its inevitable brittleness, unnaturalness and their policies acting 
more as caustic acid than glue to the society. McIntyre further states that, quote, Since the organisational success and organisational predictability exclude one another, the project of creating a wholly or largely predictable organisation committed to creating a wholly or largely predictable society is doomed, and doomed by the facts about social life. Totalitarianism of a certain kind as imagined, pardon me, as imagined by Aldous Huxley or George Orwell, is therefore impossible. What the totalitarian project will always produce will be a kind of rigidity and, and inefficiency which may contribute in the long run to its own defeat. We need to remember, however, the voices from Auschwitz and the Gulag Archipelago, which tell us just how long the long run is. The efforts of 18th century prophecy have been to produce not a scientifically managed social control, but a skillful, dramatic imitation of such control. Again, that's very similar to AI. That is why AI is an outgrowth of the techno-managerialist state. Again, it creates skillful, dramatic imitations of things, right? It's essentially damn good marketing, in layman's terms. It is histrionic success which gives power and authority in our culture, right? It's the ability to market oneself, to create hype, and again, like what it states, a, a histrionic uh, aura that surrounds, surrounds us, a, a vibe, if you will. The most effective bureaucratic is the best actor, unquote. The supposed indispensable efficacy of the bureaucratic managerial class to McIntyre is illusory from its foundational premise. Solely promoted as a trick to excuse the bestial impulses of power and the totalitarian system that it yields is, in the end, doomed to fail. The radical demolishment of culture and tradition as a way in which to annihilate the bourgeois predecessor system along with the move away from the free market structure to the limited and exclusive algorithmic structure, more akin to a feudal economic model, leads to the consequent alienation of the masses. Another reason for the said demolishment is that it is a prerequisite for the establishment of the level of unyielding control that the nascent managerial regime lust after for efficiency's sake. However, this course of action contains the seed of the regime's inexorable obliteration. For certainty, centralisation is always the natural goal of power, but the boundless bureaucracy that is required demands continually higher levels of predictability. Therefore, as power or the managerialist regimes gains closer and closer proximity to its long-awaited goal of centralisation, it subsequently renders the system sterile by the metric of economics and innovation, with a systemic inability to produce new ideas and solutions. Again, like AI, it merely regurgitates, recycles, plagiarises, paraphrases. It will only inevitably be equipped to manage its own troubled decline. We see the same thing with entertainment. Look at Disney, for example, the acolyte, um, Amazon's rings of power, right? It's, it's akin to what Tolkien stated. Good, um, pardon me, evil cannot create uh, anything new or um, emergent. It can only take what the good has already created and twist and distort and toxify it, right? Quote, law is replaced by administrative decree. Federalism is replaced by executive autocracy and a limited government replaced by an unlimited state." Unquote. Samuel T. Francis, Leviathan and its enemies, mass organisation and managerial power in 20th century America. The fabled Tower of Babel seems to thus be a recurrent pattern across the history of humanity, all to our infernal frustration naturally. The hubristic inclinations of a power that seeks to travel the well-trodden track of centralization in the hopes of reaching heaven and eating of the tree of everlasting life to become like God 
are to become the manifested Homo Deus, the transhuman entity, only to then collapse under the sheer weight of its own mismanaged ascent. It tumbles from sky to earth, eating the dust of its own humility upon the sudden stop at the bottom. Assuredly, we can glean hope in understanding that this abominable and corrupt system shall not last forever, if very much longer at all. Yet we must be cognizant of the forewarning of McIntyre in that we should not forget the terrible cost that the demise of the managerial regime shall wrought and the damage it shall continue to inflict prior to its said demise. Quote, C.S. Lewis remarked that every increase in man's power over nature can turn out to mean an increase in the power of some men over others, with nature as its instrument. Given technological progress, we need to fight hard to retain our clarity about the nature and rights of human beings, or we face what Lewis called the abolition of man. Abortion and totalitarianism both represent new possibilities of some men's power over others, and both are defended by certain ideologies of quote unquote progress. We hear of human autonomy and of man's control of his own destiny, but the autonomy is enjoyed by a select or self selected few, and the control is exercised by a shrinking elite, those who are powerless, whether unborn children or the subjects of a totalist dictatorship simply don't count, unquote. The managerial estate will become a theocracy. Its word shall be rendered sacred and digital, and its decrees unquestionable. The social credit system shall be the method of testing the faithful and maintaining their observance of the law. For if they cannot live by the law, then they shall die by the law. The state shall wrap itself in the indeterminate robes of morality, like priests of a new egalitarian paradigm that will finally correct the fallen state of man, yet at its heart it shall be a voraciously power-hungry and soullessly nihilistic despot. Its obdurate political and administrative behaviour will be its undoing, and the heretical masses of which they shall be legion will chatter amongst themselves and hatch in their minds foul plans that shall strive for the blighting of that jester who wears the crown, that false king who decreed that all should love him and despair. As blasphemy against the state and its policies will be titled as hate speech and this politically incorrect thought shall be driven from the disobedient's mind by the exorcism or atonement of re-education or, or death sentence by proxy, if one is sent to be imprisoned in facilities containing high numbers of less than tolerant extrinsic elements, so to speak. This, as is always the case with the motives of a despot, shall be veiled in the moral grandstanding of vapid egalitarian abstractions, or by vilifying and rebranding the politically and socially sensible underclasses who comprise the disaffected majority as evil incarnate. Morality and ambivalence in regards to its motives and its true structure, what we know enigmatically as the deep state, is how it maintains its power. Hence it shall seem to act in pursuit of these trite quote quote values, such as freedom, equality, equity, and empowering citizens, but it uses these as mere cloaks of deception, like the wolf that dons the costume of the sheep, as to disarm his prey of alarm and to lull them into a false sense of security, and to propel itself as the morally superior agent within the socio-political landscape. This is similar to the priest and the priest class, which throughout history, given any religion, any priest class of it, have typically been filled with corrupt elements or, or less than morally upstanding elements. But the reason the priests get into that line of profession is because it provides them the moral disguise to pursue that corruption or those deplorable predilections in relative safety and security 
again behind that moral disguise. This maintains the illusion of its benevolence, and this deceptive guise of benevolence will only be further hit home as the managerialist regime clamours for greater power and seeks to do away with the pretense of choice and vague democracy. The manipulator will always seek to moralise issues. If one possesses evil or self-centred intent, then it is effective and expedient for the realisation of the goals attached to this said intent to be justified in the mass consciousness by the vehicle of morality, God, and other euphemistic ways in which one can rationalise the irrationally cruel. If one believes they are doing God's work in the slaughter of thousands, then our natural inhibitions to such acts of barbarism and crises of conscience are left comfortably at the door as we numb ourselves to the frenzy of death. As Paul Gottfried writes in After Liberalism, Mass Democracy and the Managerial State, that the managerial state can be defined as a series of social pa uh, programs rather, informed by a vague egalitarian spirit, and it maintains its power by pointing its finger accusingly at anti-liberals. Paul Gottfried then goes on to state that it is akin to a theocratic state that establishes popular support for its policies through politically correct sanctimony and social engineering, vis-a-vis -vis incentives, societal programs that are double-edged swords for the populace, judicial decisions and legislative construction. As we would know it, the skeletal outline of the managerial state was fashioned by the endeavour of the postmodern and Marxist radicals marched through the institutions, beginning in earnest during the post-war period with such players as the Frankfurt School. This has established a civilizational ennui, a total and homogenizing disconnect from all that is sacred and traditional, a pasteurization of the nourishing cream atop the milk of life, an offensive and unsettling mitigation of our tethering to the divine spark that fuels all things vital. The dark radiance of the scrying mirrors in which we all are collectively captivated by and pour our deepest secrets out into through the unconscious tapping of its abyssal screen. And that is the soma that has led us into the unthinking present. We now bestride the cusp of loving our own servitude by the digital lotus we have been granted to eat and grow in its sensationally senseless embrace, mindless for the sake of the master's utopia that awaits him just across the brow of the next hill. Although we should not despair, for the managerialist regime, like all regimes that have come before it, shall smash itself against the wall of time and be broken into a thousand pieces. As George Orwell asserts within his critiques of Burnham's rather fatalistic vision of the managerialist state of the future, titled The Managerial Revolution and the Machiavellians, quote, the huge, invincible, everlasting slave empire of which Burnham appears to dream will not be established, or if established, it will not endure. Unquote. 